I'm Matt McClure, and this is Currents. Three communities at one Brooklyn church come together to pray for victims in Haiti. This is also an opportunity to tell the Lord, we don't like it, we don't understand it, but we trust that you know what you're doing and that you are going to lead us through this. From home plate to the altar, a ball player answers a different call. And a saintly story and heavenly music. It's a one of a kind movie experience. You know at that point when an audience is totally silent that it, they've been captured. Well, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Francesca Maxime has the night off. It will take years to replace and rebuild the church infrastructure in Haiti. That according to the head of the Bishop Subcommittee for the Church in Latin America, in a letter to fellow U.S. bishops, Archbishop J uh, Jose Gomez rather says destruction of church property was widespread and included cathedrals in Port-au-Prince and Jacmel, five other major churches, two major seminaries, and many other smaller church buildings. As the country looks at rebuilding spiritually, the physical healing also continues. Catholic Relief Services is among the many organizations delivering much-needed food to the Haitian people. Special collections have been taken at masses across the U.S. to help pay for relief there. The earthquake claimed an estimated 200,000 lives. And while relief efforts continue, so do prayers, especially right here in Brooklyn. The English, Spanish, and Creole-speaking communities of St. Jerome's Church in East Flatbush came together last Friday at a special mass. Pray so that the Haitian people may regain courage and hope and may continue their struggle because we realize that, my goodness, human life is frail and we can easily suffer great losses and a real assurance is in God. Today, actually, I went to record a song about Haiti, saying Kyrie um, Puaiti, asking, telling God, please have mercy on us, because right now, we are in doubt. Right now, we are questioning our faith, but have mercy, because it's not because we doubt your love, but it's just because we are so in so much pain that we don't know how to react to it. But please have mercy and give us time to come to you again. Tonight's Mass is a Mass of solidarity with the dead and the living, with those who have died and the survivors. We show them that they are not alone in their suffering. It is also good for our parish community, which is English-speaking, Spanish-speaking, and Creole-speaking. We had a collection and we'll send it to Catholic Relief Services, which is based in Haiti, so we know Haitians will receive and benefit from the money we collect. These kind of masses offer us that opportunity, the time to just say, you know, even if it is, Lord, I'm angry and I don't understand, just that little quiet time, and there is no greater gift than to celebrate mass. So this is also an opportunity to tell the Lord, we don't like it, we don't understand it, but we trust that you know what you're doing and that you are gonna lead us through this. This is our faith that when we or when we share the common cup and the common bread, actually there is a, the power of Jesus comes to us. So it heals and gives courage and encourages to continue the struggle of life. Uh, that uh, sufferings is part of the fabric of human life.
Well, the Vatican is also lending a helping hand to Haiti. The Holy See's Stamp and Coin Office announced it will overprint a stamp commemorating the sanctuary of Our Lady of Graces, with proceeds going to aid survivors in Haiti. The Vatican initiative is expected to bring in about $210,000. The sanctuary that the stamp commemorates is located 40 miles west of Vatican City. Well, we have much more information on how you can help over on our blog. Just go to CurrentsNY.net and click on Riding the Wave. Stay tuned, there's more Currents coming up straight ahead. Could the last Catholic hospital in New York City be about to close its doors? We'll have that plus the rest of the day's headlines when we return. Welcome back to Currents. I'm Matt McClure. Coming up in just a bit, a classic film gets a modern treatment. But first, let's check the day's headlines. Well, the days of Catholic health care in New York City could be coming to an end. Reports say the last remaining Catholic hospital in the city, St. Vincent's in Greenwich Village, could be taken over by a larger medical group and then shut down. Continuum Health Partners, which owns St. Luke's, Roosevelt, and other hospitals, is reportedly offering to take over the hospital and close all inpatient beds and surgical services at St. Vincent's within the next few months. St. Vincent's has been struggling with finances for years and is reportedly $300 million in debt. New York Archbishop Timothy Dolan released a statement today saying, quote, it would be sad and disappointing if St. Vincent's Medical Center were to close because of the unique service it has provided to our city. Well, just days after the March for Life in Washington, there are some disturbing new statistics on teen pregnancy and abortion. For the first time in more than a decade, the teen pregnancy rate is up in the U.S. The number of pregnant teens rose 3 percent in 2006. That's according to data collected by the Guttmacher Institute. The rates of teen births and abortions also rose among girls ages 15 to 19. The numbers are a reversal of the downward trend which began in the 1990s. Researchers say 7% of teen girls got pregnant in 2006. Well, a pro-life group is calling on the U.S. government to investigate a possible link between abortion and breast cancer. The Coalition on Abortion Breast Cancer is asking President Obama and congressional leaders to look into research findings that found a 40% breast cancer risk increase among women who have had abortions. The coalition says even after these findings, the National Cancer Institute claimed on its website that there was no link between abortion and breast cancer. The coalition is also calling for a stop to any proposed federal funding of abortion. In the meantime, pro-choice groups are lining up in opposition to the pro-life ad that is set to air during the Super Bowl that will feature college football star Tim Tebow. The Women's, Medical, the Women's Media Center, rather, along with other pro-choice groups, is calling on supporters to convince CBS and the NFL to ban what they call the anti-choice ad that will feature Tebow and his mother sharing personal stories and a pro-life message. The 30-second ad is being produced by the evangelical group Focus on the Family. Well, as Pope John Paul II moves closer to sainthood, more information is becoming known about his life, including the fact that he was ready to resign the papacy if he didn't feel he could do the job anymore. We get that story from Rome Reports. Sancte Romane Ecclesiae Cardinalem Boitiwa. The late Pope John Paul II was willing to resign as the head of the Catholic Church if he were to come down with an incurable disease or if anything would have happened that would have kept him from fulfilling his task. That's what he wrote in his resignation letter, which the Office of His Cause of Beatification has now published. The Pope wrote the letter in February of 1989 during the Cold War a very uncertain moment in history. Back then, he was 68 years old and healthy. In the letter, John Paul II said he would resign from the papacy in one of two cases. One, if he had a, quote, incurable disease that would prevent him from exercising the apostolic ministry, or in case of a severe and prolonged impairment that would have kept him from being the pope. Perhaps the pontiff was thinking about an accident, an attack, or a war. John Paul II entrusted in the Dean of College of Cardinals, the Cardinals of the Roman Curia, and the Vicar of Rome to decide when to accept his letter of resignation. The postulator, Slavomir Oder, published the entire text of the letter in his new book, Why He is Holy.
Thousands of Vietnamese Catholics gathered Sunday to pray for an end to persecution. Separate gatherings at the Redemptorist Monastery in Ho Chi Minh City and the Cathedral in Hanoi came after the siege of a parish in Hanoi, the beating of a religious and the desecration of a crucifix in the communist country. Reports say the U.S. Commission on Religious Freedom has asked the President and the State Department to declare Vietnam a country of particular concern. But both the Bush and Obama administrations have refused. A top Muslim cleric in Egypt is encouraging believers to answer a call from above, just not on their cell phones. It's become a popular fad in the heavily Muslim nation to use daily calls to prayer as ringtones. The cleric, though, has issued a fatwa, or religious edict, saying Muslims should do away with the fad. He says God's words are sacred, and using them as a ringtone is demeaning, inappropriate, and misleading. And finally tonight, some news about someone familiar to longtime viewers of the Net and the Prayer Channel. Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio has announced that he has placed Monsignor Michael Dempsey on administrative leave. Officials for the Diocese of Brooklyn said this is being done because Monsignor Dempsey informed the diocese that he is under investigation for possibly breaking Internet child pornography laws. At this time, Monsignor Dempsey has not been arrested or formally charged. Diocesan officials say he is fully cooperating with the investigation. Stay tuned, there's more Currents coming up straight ahead. Just ahead, forget about spring training. This ball player is headed straight for the Padres. We'll explain. Welcome back. Well, while a lot of baseball players are gearing up for spring training this time of year, at least one we know is planning to go from playing to praying. In 2009, Grant Desme had a year that many players only dream of. An outfielder playing single-A ball in the Oakland A's organization, Desme was the only minor league hitter to hit 30 home runs and steal 30 bases. He went on to the Arizona Fall League where he was named MVP for a standout play. But the possibility of stardom in the big leagues was not enough to keep him from a greater calling. So Desme decided to walk away from the game of baseball so he can begin studying for the priesthood. We spoke with him yesterday by phone at his home in California. Well, Grant Desme, now a former uh, minor league prospect with the A's organization. Thank you so much for joining us here on Currents today. We appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Now, uh, this is a decision which I guess people who are maybe not of faith might, it might baffle them. Uh, they might say, well, here's a guy who is so successful uh, and shows so much promise as a minor league ball player, and now he wants to give all of that up, the potential stardom and everything, to pursue the priesthood. Um, what, uh, what fueled this decision? Just the, the calling from God. Uh, it was really felt like I had to do and I wanted to do, and um, if my faith meant anything, yeah. um, this is really where I felt God was calling me and I had to check it out. And the whole baseball career, when I really looked at it, wasn't, uh, there's no certainty in it. Like I, I did have, God bless me, with a very successful season last year, but that was also just in A ball. I still had two more levels to go through until I even got to the, big leagues if that ha happened and I'd have to stay healthy so um, I, there was, it wasn't like I was guaranteed to be playing baseball for a long time or anything. Right, right. If, you know, and no pun intended, it's kind of a hit or miss kind of thing, you know. I mean, exactly. one injury and that could put you put you down for a, a long period of time. Right, um, right. So is this something that, was this something that was really kind of um, I don't want to use the word nagging, but uh, for lack of a better term, kind of nagging at you, and, and maybe you felt that calling, I guess I should say, for a long time. I mean, how, how long did you feel a calling before maybe you answered it? Um, I'd really been discerning it for about a year and a half. I really wanted to do it. Uh, I almost retired before last season, but I decided to go play another year. Right. Little ways that I'd try to maybe run from it or whatever, it, it wouldn't definitely wouldn't go away. Didn't really want it to happen. It it was still there. It right. showed me that I, I wanted to need to check this out, and God gave me the grace to do it. And I'm very thankful, and very I'm good, extremely man. overjoyed that I He gave me the grace to make this decision. 
Well, very good. Now, what about your teammates? Uh, did you speak to any of them about it uh, before, or have you spoken to any of them since? Um, before, not too many people really knew the extent of that I was discerning. But now, I mean, obviously everyone knows. Right. <laughs> and uh, I've gotten a ton of phone calls, text messages from old college teammates to professional teammates that uh, have been extremely supportive. And it's been a, really a blessing to see how much love and uh, support everyone's had and about the decision and the understanding that people have. I wasn't really sure how people were going to react, but it's been truly amazing and um, a blessing for me to see how many people really are supportive. Well, that's great. What about the A's organization? Were they, were they supportive of, of your decision? I mean, how did they take it? They took it extremely well, and they've been handling it even better. I, I couldn't ask for better reaction or the way they're handling it. It's been, that's been a blessing too. I mean, God has really been great in this whole situation. Great. Well, in, in terms of your studying um, and, and seminary work, things like that, where do you go from here? Um, I enter the St. Michael's Abbey. Um, it's in Southern California in August. And that's just, I, I live the light, uh, life I enter as a postulant. Um, and it's to further my discerning and um, start studying and try to figure out what God's will is. It's if he really wants me to be a priest, and if it's to that community, um, I hope so, but it's all in God's hands, really. Um, what from baseball might you be able to take life lessons, if you will, and apply those to the priesthood? Actually, I have been able to think about this quite a bit, and it's been kind of surprising to me how much I think I could see how baseball applies just to life in general or how I could use it in if in a vocation to the priesthood. Um, it's Baseball is a grind, especially in professional baseball. Um, there's a lot of things that um, you have to do that you don't really feel like doing it. You just have to do them. Um, otherwise, you're not going to be successful. You're going to break down over the course of the season. Um, and... You also, I mean, there's tough times. That's a guarantee in baseball. Baseball is a game of failure. So um, you continue to do what you know is going to make you successful. Um, so, and that's a lot from what I hear what the priest says is like it's going to be, it's a hard way of life, but it's a very fulfilling life. You're continually, you haven't, you're called to die to yourself. So um, I, I can take that lesson and then also the necessity to do things that make you successful and what's going to make me or anyone else a good priest is grace from God. So making sure that I really have a strong prayer life um, is really uh, important even when I don't feel like praying at the time or whatever. I know that's what I have to do. So Well, good. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, definitely a lot of... Uh a lot of life lessons and metaphors there to take from, from baseball and apply them to the priesthood. Well, very good, Grant. Thank you so much for being a part of uh, the show. We appreciate your time. Yeah, well, thank you for having me on. Thanks. Bye-bye. Right. Baseball player and future seminarian, Grant Desmay. Stay with us. There's more current straight ahead. When we return, the big screen story of Joan of Arc gets a modern update. What is so striking about it is that there's intense close-ups of the faces all throughout this movie. And everything is just incredibly intense. Well, finally tonight, a dramatic new sound for a silent film. The film is The Passion of Joan of Arc, an often overlooked masterpiece from 1928, directed by Carl Theodore Dreyer. Well, last week, the film was given a rare showing in Manhattan with a full choir and orchestra. We stopped by to give a look and have a listen. The story is incredible. I mean, I, I didn't, I knew 
basic outlines of her life before, but seeing this movie was just amazing because these are actual, it's a transcript of the trial. Maybe it was a very long and boring movie, but then I completely changed my my opinion because I was very impressed by the personality of the character of um, uh, Jeanne d'Arc and uh, the expression of her face that I think was, com was communicating a lot, was communicating a lot of passion and uh, a lot of uh, love for God. Uh, this is not the first time I've seen the film. I saw it on the Criterion Collection DVD that I bought a couple of years ago. I've never seen it, however, with a live performance of Voices of Light, which is absolutely magnificent. So I was very impressed by watching it at home on television, but much more impressed with a large screen and the magnificent uh, performance here tonight. The, the music and how they performed was perfect in uh, completely harmony with the, the scenes that we watched. What is so striking about it is that there's intense close-ups of the faces all throughout this movie. And so you're seeing the anguish, the, the meanness of the, the jailers and when they're tortured, and her anguish. Apparently all, all along the way she's terrified of being burned at the stake. That's the, 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 the thing that she fears most. And so you, you had these intense close-ups of, of the faces, the faces of the priests, when she receives communion, everything is just incredibly intense. Um, she stood up against both the government, the state, and the church at the same time. When you just didn't do that in her period. In that, in that period, it's hard to do even now. So she was a remarkable, remarkable form, a woman of great faith. She said, I lied, and... Uh, she admitted she's, she was certain that she was sent by God. That was a, a clear example that she was available to die for him. I think it really captures the personal dimension of, of faith that this is not an abstract thing, but uh, this is worth giving your life for. It was interesting to me also in the quiet moments you didn't hear a peep out of the audience. I mean, they were just, you could, and you know at that point when an audience is totally silent that it, they've been captured. Great film and great music there, great, great combination as well. Well, that's it for this edition of Currents. Now, tomorrow, three letters every immigrant should know. TPS, it's Temporary Protected Status. We'll have insight on what that means for Haitian immigrants tomorrow. But in the meantime, remember, you do not need a TV to watch Currents. You can always catch us online at CurrentsNY.net. Until next time, thank you so much for watching. I'm Matt McClure. Have a great night.